Okay, this is 13.7. And what we're going to do is pretty much look at some applied problems. And we'll use everything that we've learned before uh, to solve those problems. And they're going to be quadratic in nature. So I don't know if I defined it last time. But let me, if I did, fine. If I didn't, here it is. A quadratic equation. So this will be an equation in the variable x. As the form, this is in general form, a x squared plus b x plus c is equal to zero. The only stipulation is that a is not equal to zero. B and C can be equal to zero, and clearly A, B, and C are real numbers. And of course, sometimes you'll see these with the A, B, and C written in lowercase. And for right now, and that's going to be the case for this class, the only way you can solve such a problem is to factor this degree 2 trinomial and it's going to factor into Rx plus SMX plus P and then you set each one of these factors Rx plus S equals to 0 or MX plus P equals to zero. So this is all the stuff you've been doing in general symbols. And I know as soon as I go to general symbols, you get lost. Try not to, because this is the essence of math. And the more you advance into math, the more you're going to be seeing things. I could use a specific value of A and B and C, but math is far more general than that. It goes for all values of a, b, and c as long as a is not equal to zero. Anyway, enough of that. Let's actually just get down to some working some problems. So we're supposed to represent, uh, not that one, this one. We're supposed to represent each of the given conditions with the single variable and they request that it be X uh, I don't really care so we have what they want us to do here we have length and we have width so they want us to represent these two relationships in the single variable X but we have to get some more information so if we read on down here, it says width, so I'm going to say width is equal to half the measure of the length. So width is, width is, I just abbreviated it by W, is becomes equals half is one half times length. So that means if I want to let L equal to length be my unknown. And if you want, you can choose X to be equal to length. Then X is equal to my length. And the width is 1 half times L, or using the variable X, 1 half times X. Or if you prefer, I myself do, I prefer instead of saying 1 half times x, I prefer x divided by 2, but both of these are the same. So there we did it. If length is x, then width is 1 half times x. So that's not so bad. So let's do the next one. Two consecutive integers. 
So here's one of these things, if you're given a question and you don't know what a word means, you look it up. But consecutive means one right after the other. That's what it means. And I would say most of you are aware of that meaning. So this was, this is what? I guess this is 1B, so we're still on 1B. So integer 1. Or if I want to say the first integer. And then the next integer. That's the consecutive integer. So if I let x be my first integer, then the next integer is going to be what? So if 8 is my first integer, what's the next whole number? 9. If minus 11, is my first integer. What's the next? So we're moving in the direction toward the positive end. Minus 10. So how do I get from 8 to 9? Well 9 is equal to 8 plus 1. How do I get from minus 11 to minus 10? Well minus 10 is equal to minus 11 plus 1. So the general is if x is my first integer then the next integer is obtained by x plus 1. Literally, I would like it better if they disambiguated a little bit. The next integer in the positive direction. But pretty much that's how it is usually used in English. And they don't say that, but uh, it does disambiguate. Okay, the next one. The base and the height. So that's what we want. We want an expression for the base and another one for the height. So the height, h, I'm just being lazy here. If you want me to, I can write out the whole thing, is equal to 3 less than 5 times the base. So that's the same as 5 times the base. So I'm going to let my base be x. So that's 5 times x. And then I'm taking away 3. So height is 5x minus 3. If you want to say, height is equal to 5 times the base minus 3, then you're perfectly fine for using the variable b for base and 5b minus 3. These two expressions are the same. The only difference is our choice of variables, and it doesn't matter. Uh, the instruction said choose x. I never really care. Choose whatever you want. Uh, but since the instructions choose x in my math lab, may want that too. I'm, I'm trying to follow the instructions. Okay, so now we're going to use the information to solve the following problems. And here you're actually going to learn something new. Now you're going to actually learn the square root principle. So let's look at... So the area of a square is 144 square feet. So let's look at the most general. If you have a rectangular room, so a rectangle has a length times a width. And if you want to know how much carpet you need for this area, you find the area by multiplying the length times the width. But a square is a special type of a rectangle where the length of each side, now I'm going to switch to the variable x, is the same. Every side has the same length, but the area then is equal to x times x, which is shorthand for 
x squared. So the area of a square is 144 square feet. So the fact that it's in feet tells you what unit the end result will be for your length. And 100 area is equal to x squared. That's my guiding formula. So 144 is equal to x squared, where x is what? The length of one side. I find it easier just to use L for length. It reminds you, but they want us to use X. So how are we going to solve this? We have to turn it into a quadratic equation. So that means I'm going to move. You can do one of two, but I'm going to move the 144 over here. So I have to have it in the form of AX squared plus B x plus c is equal to 0. That's the same thing as saying 0 is equal to a x squared plus b x plus c. So what I'm going to do, let me get some more room up here, coming down here now, is I've moved the 144 to the other side, leaving a 0 behind. So it's the same as subtracting 144 to both sides. So x squared minus 144. Now I've told you there's only one game in town to solve this. And we solve this by factoring the resulting polynomial. But before I do this, if this is equal to ax squared plus bx, plus c, you should be able to see that a is the coefficient to the x squared term. So in this case, a is equal to 1. There is no x term. So b is equal to 0. That's perfectly fine. And c is equal to minus 144. So that's going to be an important tool that you'll be able to do later on at the very, very, very end of intermediate algebra. For right now, we don't need it, but I did want to take the time and point that out. We can factor this, can't we? So I'm hoping you're seeing right now that that's a minus sign and there is no middle x term. So if I remember that 144 is 12 squared, then I have the difference of perfect squares. So that factorization is x minus 12 and x plus 12. So x minus 12 times x plus 12 is equal to 0. That means x minus 12 is equal to 0 or x plus 12 is equal to 0. The first one says x is equal to 12 and what is our unit? Our unit is feet. And the second says, or x is equal to minus 12 feet. Well, as, as is often the case in applied problems, we don't have any intuition or meaning attached to minus 12 feet. Feet is the form of a distance, and distance is always positive. So what we do is I throw out this answer and say this is the only answer that makes sense in this particular problem. But we just noticed that this is a property that you'll later learn uh, and some of you may very well have been tempted to solve this problem by taking the square root of both sides But the answer is the positive value of x is equal to 12. And that's going to give you the answer. But the real answer is x, which is both positive and negative, is equal to plus or minus 12. This is just all stuff that you will do 
later in intermediate algebra, literally at the very end of the course. I'm getting ready to do that very thing right now. I find it really helpful to uh, kind of give you the heads up before you get there. Even though you're not held responsible for it now, the seed has been planted and you'll be surprised uh, how much that helps because it's in there, it's in your brain somewhere. So when you see it again, somehow you, your brain knows what's going on. So let's go over here. So here we're going to have a circle. Impressive, huh? I figured out how to use some things. So we have a circle and we have what more is that is the diameter of the circle just reminding you some basic and right there the midpoint between those two which I'm going to say right here is called the center the length from the center to the edge if this is the diameter is called the radius and the radius plus the radius is equal to the diameter or two times the radius is equal to the diameter and the area of the circle and what are we talking about the area if I have a circle here then if you were to paint this circle a certain color like for example there's probably a fill command I could do uh, I have no idea how to do it. Flood fill. Oh. Oh, I'll be danged. Well, that's not so bad. So the area, if I would have known that before, I wouldn't have scribbled that around. So the area is basically all of the stuff or the amount of paint in square inches that you would have to have available to paint all of that. So we have the formula area A stands for area is equal to pi so that's a mathematical constant that stands for an actual number times the radius squared so don't worry about pi pi is approximately equal to 3.1415 nine two six five four and that's all I have it memorized too the point is pi is irrational so this decimal expansion goes on and on and on forever without ever repeating but this is our formula for the area of a circle of radius r and right there is the radius radius if you can't see that radius is one half the distance of a line that goes from one edge to the other that passes through the center so we want to find the radius if the area, so my guiding equation is area is equal to pi r squared. And we're given that the area, so I'm going to replace the a with the 81 pi. So we want to find the radius. I'm solving for r. And the radius is always going to be a positive distance. So notice that both of these, what's on the left-hand side and what's on the right-hand side has a factor of pi. So there's two ways you can do this. Um, I kind of, it doesn't really matter. It's all the same in the end. Since pi is non-zero, I can divide both sides through by pi. And by doing so, it's probably easier to do it the way I'm doing it here. The pi's cancel. And I'm left with 81 is equal to r squared. So here's going to be a, e a little bit easier to handle. I'm going to take this 81. I'm going to move it over here. And I'm, 0 is left behind. 
and it's going to proceed exactly as we did before. I'm going to write 81 is 9 squared. So that's the difference of squares, factorization, r minus 9 times r plus 9. And all of these are equal to 0. So that means r minus 9 is equal to 0, or r plus 9 is equal to 0. The first one gives a value of r is equal to 9, where the second value is given r is equal to minus 9. And since our unit was square inches, so these are inches, when we It doesn't make any sense minus, again, it's a unit of measurement, it's a distance. So the answer of minus 9 doesn't make any sense. So we just declare the only answer to this particular applied problem is the radius is equal to 9 inches. And that's the answer. Okay. This one's actually a really interesting one. It's, it brings a lot of stuff together. So the sum of two numbers is 16. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to let x be my first number. And the other number I'll call y. So if x is my first number, and when I add x plus y, I get 16. If I solve for y, I get y is equal to 16 minus x. So I've expressed y as 16 minus x. So those are my two numbers. So the sum, the sum of their squares is 130. So that means the first number squared plus the second number squared is equal to 130. The thing to remember here is the base is y. So y is 16 minus x. So I'm going to replace y with 16 minus x. And of course it has to be squared. And that's equal to 130. So now I have to start simplifying. x squared is brought down. So now I'm going to use my special products. 16 squared is 256. Minus 2 times x times 16 is minus 32x. So that was minus 2 times 16 times x. And then plus x squared is equal to 130. So we collect like terms. And I think it will be helpful to write things on the left-hand side in descending powers. So x squared plus x squared is 2x squared. So I combine those like terms. Minus 32x plus 256 is equal to 130. I can't solve it in this form. I have to be able to use the zero factor property. So what I have to do is I have to move that 130 over. And when I move it over, it changes sign and leaves a zero on the other side. So again, just simplifying, 2x squared minus 32x, 256 minus 130 is 126, and that's equal to zero. And now I'm going to remember something really, really important in this one. It makes it so much easier. Factor out the GCF. 
Not every term have, has an x, so that's out, but every term is divisible by 2. So I can factor out a 2. Two x squared divided by two leaves an x squared. Minus 32x divided by two is minus 16x. And 126 divided by two is plus 63. So now all I have to factor is this trinomial right here whose leading term is one. That's so much easier than trying to do it the other way. As a matter of fact, I struggled. I Sometimes I just do things. And uh, I struggled finding the factorization before I realized, oh, I need to factor out a 2. So I'm going to have an x squared term, then a 63, and then a minus 16x. So what I fill in up here is obvious. They both have to be x's. That's one of the niceties of getting it down so that the leading coefficient is 1. And 63 is 9 times 7. So if, But this is negative. So if I do minus 9 times minus 7, minus 9 times minus 7 is 63. x times x is x squared. x times minus 9 is minus 9x x times minus 7 is minus 7x. Minus 9x minus 7x is minus 16x. So my factorization is now complete. So this is 2 times x minus, not, uh, x minus 7 times x minus 9. And that's equal to 0. So that means x minus 7 is equal to 0. <clears throat> or x minus 9 is equal to 0. So we have two possible values of x. x is equal to 7, or x is equal to 9. And using either one of those, and the fact that y is equal to 16 minus x, I can get the value of y. So let's just do it. So let x equal 7. Then y is equal to 16 minus x, which is 16 minus 7, which is 9. So if x is 7, y is equal to 9. No surprise. Now let's suppose that x is equal to 9. Then y is equal to 16 minus x, which is 9, which is equal to 7. So if x is equal to 7, y is, if x is equal to 9, y is equal to 7. So really, this gives you all the information you need right here. Okay, so last one. I think we might do one of the in-class problems, and that'll be it. So a roofer drops a hammer from the top of a 64-foot roof. Better to drop a hammer than himself, because that's way up there. The height of the hammer after t seconds, so this is a quadratic in t, is given by the formula h, which stands for height, is equal to minus 16 t squared plus 64. When will the hammer hit the ground? So we're, when is a time word. Time word, not time lord. So that means we're solving for t, which is time. And of course, it's a polynomial in the variable t. So the next question is, what is the height of the hammer when it hits the ground? Well, when something hits the ground, it's at height zero inches above the ground. So I literally, it's asking me to solve zero is equal to minus 16 t squared 
plus 64. Here, let's factor out the GCF. As it turns out, uh, I'm going to factor out the negative GCF, minus 16. Because I want the, the coefficient on the t squared term to be positive. So I'm going to factor out minus 16. You always have the possibility, once you find the GCF, to factor out its negative. So minus 16 t squared divided by minus 16 leaves a t squared. That's, that's what I wanted. I wanted the coefficient there to be plus 1. And 64 divided by minus 16 is minus 4. Well, I can take care of this because I can write t squared minus 4 is t squared minus 2 squared and factor t squared minus 2 squared. Well, t squared minus 2 squared is t minus 2 times t plus 2. And all of these are equal to 0. So minus 16 is not equal to 0, but that implies then either t minus 2 is equal to 0 or t plus 2 is equal to 0. So, so the first implies t is equal to 2, and this is in seconds, if you want to put that in there. The second one implies t is equal to minus 2 seconds. Now, in a certain sense, we have a meaning for minus 2 seconds. Because if I say minus 2 seconds ago, it was 2 seconds before I started the clock. But the clue here is how many seconds after you drop it. So they want to know the positive value. And to be honest with you, it doesn't make any sense to use the negative anyway. So where was it at minus 2 seconds before you dropped it? Clearly it doesn't necessarily have to be on the ground. So in this case, this has no meaning, no interpretation. So t is equal to 2 seconds is the only answer that fits this particular problem. So we learn that sometimes math gives us more than one answer. But not all of these answers make sense in a given context. And if you find this answer rather perplexing, why shouldn't they all make sense, then you're starting down the road toward not math, but philosophy of math. And that's an interesting field. Uh, but the methods to answer those questions go well beyond anything that we learn in math. So let's just do one more question. And I don't know how you find, if you have a proposed answer, I don't know if you how you find out whether it's correct or not. So I don't... Trust me, I've gone down that path many times. Uh, whoops, again, wrong thing. Right thing. So I'm uh, challenging you right now. This is, we usually don't do in-class practice problems, but we've not done an awful lot this time. So I would like to do this one in particular because I know uh, that you'll probably see something like this on on the uh, homework anyway. So I'm going to try to draw a rectangle. And we'll just pretend that's our rectangle. I know it's not perfect, but it's perfect, more perfect doing that than me trying to freehand it. So we have, if you want, 
we'll call this the width and that the length. If you don't like that choice, you can make this the length and that the width. Who cares? The width is represented by x minus 3. The length is equal to x plus 2. The area, in general, is equal to width times length. In this case, the area is 24 square inches, so our unit is going to be inches. Width is x minus 3. Length is x plus 2. So let's solve this problem. I'm going to write it up here. Or no, I won't. I don't have to rewrite it. I'm just going to move things over here. There we go. So this is 24. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply out this. So you should be able to, in your head, or in some method, so that's, sorry, that's a minus. In your head or in some method, you should be able to multiply those two out. I actually use FOIL when they're really simple like this. And you can use FOIL as well. So the first is x squared. I have to give myself some more room here. The outer is 2 times x. The inner is minus 3x. And the last, minus 3 times 2 is minus 6. So I have 24 is equal to x squared gather those terms, plus 2x minus 3x is minus x, minus 6. But I have to have this equal to 0, so again I'm going to move the 24 over. The 24 is going to be taken from its seat and moved over here. So the answer is going to be, of course, it has to pay the price of changing its sign. So 0 is equal to x squared minus x minus 6 minus 24. So 0 is equal to x squared minus x minus 30. So all we have to do is factor that trinomial. It won't be hard, especially because the first row is two x's. Minus 30, I'm going to say that's minus 6 times 5. Minus 6 times 5 is minus 30. x times x is uh, x squared. So x times minus 6 is minus 6x. X. x times 5 is plus 5. Minus 6x X plus 5x is minus x. So the factorization is x plus 5 times x minus 6. So that means x plus 5 is equal to 0 or x minus 6 is equal to 0. That implies x is equal to minus 5 and this implies x is equal to 6. So Notice if I choose as a possible value x is equal to minus 5, then I have a length is equal to x plus 2, which is equal to minus 5 plus 2, which is equal to minus 3. So I have a negative length. So that one does not make sense. So doesn't work. I could have just as easily used width. Width is equal to x minus 3. And if x were minus 5, that would be minus 5 minus 3, which is also a negative length. So this one doesn't work for the context, but this one does. So x is equal to 6 is our only solution. So that's it for, I think, this entire chapter. I think we're going to chapter 14 after this. And uh, the adventure continues.